Hello and welcome to piracy and British responses to it on the China Station in 1920s and 1930s, Long Patrol, part one of, well, at least three parts will be devoted to the presentation. I'm possibly going to do another part on the questions from the live. And there could well be a fifth, which is on questions for that generated, are generated by this. So, you know, could be part one of five or parts one of four. And it starts off, as all these things do, when you're talking about the British in the 20th century. With the British in the 19th century. And in this case, it's the Treaty of Tinsen in 1826, Articles 52 and 53. British ships of war, coming for no hostile purpose, or being engaged in pursuit of pirates, shall be at liberty to visit all ports within the dominions of the Emperor of China, and shall receive every facility, uh, facility for the purchase of provisions, procuring water, and if occasion require for the making of repairs. The commanders of such ship shall hold intercourse with the Chinese authorities in terms of equality and courtesy. Consideration of the injury sustained by native and foreign commerce from the prevalence of piracy in the seas of China, the high contracting parties agreed to concert to concert measures of its suppression. So, what are the key things that are agreed in this? Well, key. Apparently, the British are supposed to tell everyone if they're coming for hostile purposes. <laughs> um, when they're docking, rather than just to turn up pretending they're not for hostile purposes and start opening fire. And piracy is covered by two things. One, they're allowed to come in steaming into port if they're in, well, sailing into port hard. If they are pursuing pirates, but technically, they're also supposed to be doing joint operations with the local authorities on counter piracy, i.e. they are supposed to be coordinating with their Chinese colleagues and counterparts in the purposes of it. So, you know, basically they're supposed to get Chinese support. And here is the really big thing. You can leave all the stuff about, you know, what the ship's allowed to do. That just makes life a lot easier, especially if you don't have to constantly uh, ha be talking to the local embassy consulates and making sure you're near them for them to sort out all these facilities that the local uh, officials will assist you on an equitable basis with sorting out these provisions. But here's the key phrase. The commanders of such ships shall hold intercourse with the Chinese authorities on terms of equality and courtesy. Equality and courtesy matters. Equality and courtesy is a big, big thing. Because basically it says we're equals. Now that's a big thing for China to say. It's understandable for the British to ask it. What's really interesting is that these, this treaty takes place in 1856. The first Rear Admiral China Station is technically not appointed till 1862-1864. It's interesting. If you read the front of this book, it says eighteen sixty the China Station, eighteen sixty four till nineteen forty one. However, you will look at the first admiral listed in it, and just to make it sort of fun, this is Rear Admiral Augustus Leopold Cooper, K U P E R, and it is eight of February eighteen sixty two to seventeenth January eighteen sixty five. So, what is it? Well. There is a reason for this. He'd only been appointed a rear admiral in 1861, and he is first appointed CNC, Commander-in-Chief, East Indies and China Station. 
East Indies and China Station. The steam frigate Euryalus. In 1864, it's turned from being a combined command, really based on Singapore, despite it not theoretically being based on Singapore, but let's be honest, where's the only port in between the East Indies and China Station where you can really sort of be considered in both Singapore? He has the steam frigate Euryalus, which is always useful. And there really are a lot of British involvement going on here. But you must remember, this is one officer who is technically required to map out all sorts of areas and work out where he's going, but also is the CNC as far as it goes for this entire area. All the bits in blue, you can see here. Indian Ocean, Southeast Asia, South China Sea, quite a large chunk of the Pacific, all are technically his area. And, interesting enough, he actually spends most of his time <laughs> dealing with issues from Japan. <laughs> so really doesn't get to spend a lot of time watching China. And honestly, it is therefore, unsurprisingly, that it's the next ones including a temporary Vice Admiral, George St. Vincent King, uh, who uh, does the most to establish the China Station, as we would understand it, and to establish, really, some of the issues which come with counter-piracy. It also is during this period, well, this comes out. As seen above, during Admiral Cooper's, uh, Cooper's term in office in 1864, the Taiping Rebellion finally had been put down. During a long period of unrest, many Chinese had sought a new life overseas. Another consequence had been a very considerable transformation of Hong Kong, early signs of which were most apparent during Admiral King, this is George St. Vincent King's term of office. In 1867, just three years after the Taiping Rebellion was crushed, the number of Chinese uh, general merchants in Hong Kong had risen to more than 70, from fewer than 10 in 1846. The combination of the Taiping Rebellion and the growth of the Chinese communities overseas did more than save Hong Kong from economic depression. It changed the island's basic reason for being. Hong Kong was transformed from a colonial outpost into the centre of a transnational trade network, stretching from the China coast to Southeast Asia, and then to Australia and North America. And this begins the piracy, the issues with piracy, because you still have, um, argued from this point on, a China which has a lot of internal problems, a lot of internal issues when it comes to running itself, and a lot of corruption. Basically, I would say China was <sighs> caught on the hoof without a navy. It had grown such a massive navy, a navy under Admiral Zheng He, and then hit had gone down. Now trying to rebuild it when there's already bigger players in town. 
and they have internal issues. They have both external and internal issues to deal with. External predators and internal dividers. And some of those external predators have different thinking about it. Some are happy to let China carry on because, frankly, they don't want the cost of administrating it. Uh, others, others see a land of opportunity for flag mar uh, for flag waving. And into this comes the poor Royal Navy, and I do say poor Royal Navy because, honestly, the Royal Navy is getting more and more of the world it has to secure. This is the point of the empire. And it keeps growing bigger. And as America has found, you can have a war-winning fleet, but if they ain't got enough ships that you are in enough places at the same time, you look weak. And the moment you look weak, then others will start building their war-winning, start trying to build a war-winning fleet. And whilst maybe you'll be able to take them, maybe you won't. It's often surprising who the actual successor is in the prime roles. It's often not the one. If you look in history, uh, let's see, Germany was building up. And yes, they might have taught to build a risk fleet and all these things. But honestly, they're building up. They wanted to be a power to supplant Britain as number two in the world, uh, as sort of no, maybe number one in the world and take that on. And what actually happens? Well, by the end of World War Two, it's America and Russia. Followed by Britain. And let's be honest, if you want to do more than fight locally to Russia, it's America and Britain. I. America. Let's be honest, Congress was never happy with paying for anything. America really didn't want to take it on. They might have talked about taking on and grand plans, but they didn't really want it. Well, that's the kind of world that poor China was suffering through their troubles in at this time. And so the treaty is in sin. And you have the poor Royal Navy having to take on the job of counter piracy because one of the first things you find that goes when you have enough internal problems, and I'm not talking Russian level of captain selling off his own ship's propeller. But navies are things which require long-term thinking and a lot of work to keep going. Now we go to a lovely journal article uh, by A.D. Blue, Piracy on the China Coast, page 77. As old-fashioned piracy died out with the coming of steamships, so this is relevant to the 1920s and 30s now. The world's moved on, but it hasn't really changed. They've still got the same piracy issues. They've still got the same problems. A new kind of design uh, designed to cope with new, uh, new conditions. A new kind designed to cope with new conditions appeared. Basically, traditional piracy was pretty much any junk which thought it had a chance and had a captain or crew so inclined could well start doing piracy and the Royal Navy would have to deal with it. Almost, it's going to sound strange, the steamship era almost starts to professionalize it. It had been democratic piracy in many respects in the South China Sea up to this point, because everyone could do it. But after the steamships appeared, you start to need skills, specific capabilities. Not everyone who sails on the fishing boat can actually sail a steamship. Not this time. While some kind of the new pirates may have been recruited from the old, new piracy required a knowledge of modern shipping practices, unlikely to have been common among the old fishermen pirates. As before, however, the new style piracy was most prevalent around Hong Kong. It's the richest trade hub for China. It's where all the trade nexuses come together. Unsurprisingly, sir, it's the place of the fattest of fattest prizes. So therefore it's problematic. And the problem for Britain is it's the furthest away from all its support. So yes, they have ships based there. Yes, they 
are always there in force and visible, and let's be honest, none of those parts are going to challenge Britain for its right to rule Hong Kong. None of them are building up that big a pirate fleet. But, They are going to call, uh, be more uh, more problematic. Uh, there is a level at which the British are not going to are not going to be able to do anything about about it. It's only when they go over a certain level the British Navy will get involved because you need these ships for other things. You need them to watch the Japanese. You need them to watch the Germans, the French, the Chinese government officials who are really acting weird lately. That sounded strange there, but think about it. Sometimes the, these government officials seem to be considering to conspire to appoint themselves as the new ruler of China. Sometimes they're allying with different ones. Sometimes they're on the take. Sometimes they're being blackmailed by triads. So sometimes they really are strange. And you're sitting there going, as a, as a British sort of official, going, uh, what's going on here? And it's not unusual for the Navy to have to go and do a bit of naval diplomacy and investigate, because, again, Sloop goes along. Hello, what's the problem here? Or Yanks the river, gum, uh, uh, river gunboat goes along and goes, Hello, what's the problem here? And finds out. Because they're your tools of investigation. You don't have satellites. I know, in everyone's mind, you have James Bond or some other specialist secret agent, but believe it or not, the number of secret agents that Britain had that could speak Chinese fluently and managed to disappear inside China, come back where, uh, you know, with the job done, very, very small at this time. Probably one or two people, if they have any. They probably have bigger fish for them to fry. If they are being used out there at all. So. Who gets the job? We're having issues contacting this local station up here. Are you by any chance... Uh, you're going to leave on patrol. Could you by any chance go past there? Yes, Governor. S a little ship toddles up, four inch gun, a couple of marines, a couple of armed sailors, an officer or two, a, senior, a chief petty officer or two, go for a wander. Hopefully they find out what needs to be found out and they can sort it out. If they can't, they call for reinforcements. But that means the reinforcements have to be waiting for them somewhere. This is one of the problems people often forget when I talk about these things, is if you have reinforcements, they need to be somewhere where they can go to it. You can't be doing another job, because you can't have to extract them from what they're doing, form them up, make sure they're armed up and suitable for the next other operation, and then go. They have to be sitting, waiting for that operation. One of the, the, the thing which is often forgotten in terms of armed forces is the necessity of maintaining slack for unforeseen circumstances. A reserve. For unforeseen circumstances. And the greatest failure of long-term thinking and long war anal potential analysis is the fact that more and more nations are, not, are cutting their reserve because whether it's regular or actual reservist units in terms of capabilities, because if they cut it, uh, they're cutting it because it saves money. That's short term. In a war, it's, it takes a lot longer and costs a lot more in lives and treasure to build it up suddenly, as we're currently finding out when it comes to biomedical system, uh, security and um, virus pandemic management. Anyway, as before, however, the new style of piracy was most prevalent around Hong Kong, embarrassing close to the headquarters of the anti-piracy forces. It was adding insult to injury when the steam launch, uh, launch Wo Fat Shing was pirated in Hong Kong Harbor in 1927 and $30,000 in gold bars stolen. Newspapers made great play out of such facts. Highly colorful accounts of pirate companies being established in Hong Kong along sound business lines, replete with boards of directors and so on. 
were common in the British and American press in the 1920s and early 30s. The rumor that some of these companies had attractive Chinese women in command added some spice to these stories. Well, of course, one of the most successful pirates of all time was a lady, a Chinese pirate, and I'm sure some did have women in charge, but I can't speak to their attractiveness. Um, the reality is, though, no, boards of directors, no. That's more British privateering from about the Tudor era. And not really sound business lines. Most of them were extensions of either triad groups, local fishing clans, or things like that. Or, and this is another problem, sometimes the various government factions, or factions which claim to be governments of China, also had piracy wings. Whee! To try and raise some money. <sighs> Hence the occasional problems with the leadership. Life's good. Anyway, 1919 to 1924. Who do we have in charge? Who has got the job of dealing with the world for the Royal Navy? Well, it is Vice Admiral Sir Alexander Ludovic Duff. And then Admiral Sir Arthur Kavanagh Leveson, 1922 to 4. Uh, so, World War I is over. The RNs demobilizing, redeploying, redesigning itself. And therefore, it has to work out again what it's going to be doing in the Far East. And it has to keep an eye on Japan, remember. Japan's come out of World War I as both a friend, but also something potentially more could go either way. Vice Admiral Duff, therefore, is unsurprisingly sent to the Far East on uh, with a new cruiser, HMS Hawkins, under the com uh, which was under the command of the then Captain Reginald Henderson, future third sea lord, who would dual hat as his captain chief staff until June 1921. It was in March 1921 when the RN's critical Higher Command of the Pacific and its headquarters conference was convened. This conference would conclude that Singapore is the only site suitable for the location of Higher Command, as well as for the main fleet base. The loss of Singapore would be disastrous to the British Empire. It would be. And Leveson is described as, He was endowed with brains of an exceptional character and with great power in the acquisition of all sorts of knowledge, with information and information. Those who partook of his ever-ready hospitality would be sure to find the map and book relating to the latest topic of interest laid on his table, and would listen to his incisive judgments with pleasure and interest. It was indeed remarkable that one, uh, one whose life had been largely spent in the study of the more material side of an exacting profession should have found time to assimilate a knowledge of history and geography combined that was far above the average. His genial presence will be greatly missed. Written by Admiral Sir William Goodenough, Commander, Second Light Cruiser Squadron, World War One, President of the Royal Geographical Society at this time when he's writing us. Simply put, the RN couldn't deploy lots more ships. It couldn't deploy battle fleets to the Far East. Yeah, there wasn't the money. What it could do is deploy smart officers to go in and properly assess the situation with more smart officers as part of their staffs, and it could send its newest cruisers, because the Far East was about presence. <sighs> and a battleship has gravitas, has presence, has menace. It's lovely. But a single battleship, when the other guy's got a whole battle fleet, doesn't really scare anyone. Coming and doing a visit, it shows that your battle fleet can reach there. Staying there on station, it's kind of like the sort of totem pole. Uh, this, well, not the really totem pole, this sort of weak, weak totem. It just doesn't work. But cruisers, cruisers can pop up lots of places. They're powerful, but you know they're not the most powerful ships in the enemy fleet, so you know there's something bigger that can come. And there's a few of them wandering around, but you know they have many of them. So you sink one, well, that's great. We've got another 69. 
we don't want to lose people, but in terms of combat, actual high quality combat power of our force, you haven't really taken us down that much. We've got lots of other assets we can use. But also, to sink one is going to require significant force. And it could do damage at the same time. So they are sort of that. Uh, for 1920s and 30s, cruisers are at that right level of presence, of strength. Some key events from this period. Well, you have the Washington Naval Treaty, and you have a lot of stuff going on. In 1921, you have the RN's Higher Command Conference, which will be mentioned. But also at the same time, you have the Sempil, well, virtually the same one, the Sempil Mission. Now, officially, the British Air Ministry pretends they're indifferent to this. Unofficially, uh, it wouldn't have happened until it wouldn't take place without them doing a lot of support. In 1922, February, the Nine Power Agreement is concluded by Britain, USA, Japan, France, Italy, Belgium, Holland, Portugal, and China to respect China's sovereignty, independence, territorial preservation, and equality of trade opportunities. All well, these powers have various commitments in China, and basically it's um, lots of people promising they're not going to take any more than they've already got. In March, HMS Renown arrives in Singapore, as it took the Prince of Wales on his Far East tour, take him around Japan between April and May, so they have HMS Renown going out solo. Later on, HMS uh, Hood and HMS Repulse would do a whole cruise. Not, of course, going to Japan, but going through Australia and Hawaii. Here's the thing. Why are they doing this? Why battle cruisers showing up on the battleships? Well, what's the bigger threat Britain can make to Japan? That we can send a battle fleet, which will slowly get out there and eventually fight a battle when you choose to come out to fight it. Because remember, at this point, carriers haven't really developed what they will become. The Royal Navy's got plans. <laughs> you know, they've developed the Salt of Cuckoo for a reason. Uh, they have no desire to go through World War One ever again with this fleet in being concept. They will find a way to get into that frickin' harbour and get to you. But at this point, it ain't that. So what can they threaten Japan with? What can they impress Japan with? Battle cruisers. And yes, Japan's building the Congos, but... You know. 1903, September, there's a massive earthquake in Tokyo, Yokohama, region of Japan. Hawkins, with Admiral Everson aboard, uh, first goes to Shanghai to pick up the doctors and materials before heading to assist. So they go and get it from the International Hospital and the various hospitals in Shanghai. 1924, new causeway built between Singapore and Malay Peninsula, officially opened. So you've built a lovely causeway to what is supposed to be your most secure station and hub for command of future operations. You haven't yet built the base, and you certainly haven't built the defences. November. Admiral Everson wrote, War outside Shanghai ended when Ho Feng Ling, his associates, fled to Japan on the 13th of on Shanghai Maru. Chi Hsien was the victor. Foreign settlements is untouched. That's what we've been watching. And why does the Washington Naval Treaty get a mention? Well, because the United States, the British Empire, and Japan agreed that the status quo at the time of signing the present treaty with regard to fortifications and naval bases shall be maintained in their respective territories and possessions specified hereunder. The insular possessions which the United States now holds or may hereafter acquire in the Pacific Ocean, except A, those adjacent to the coast of the United States, Alaska, and Panama Canal Zone, not including Aleutian Islands and B, the Hawaiian Islands, Hong Kong, and insular possessions which the British Empire now holds, or may hereafter acquire in the Pacific east of the Med uh, Mercedon, of 110 degrees east longitude, except A, those adjacent to the coast of Canada, B, the Commonwealth of Australia and its territories, and C, New Zealand. The following is the territories and possessions of Japan in the Pacific Ocean, to wit, the Kuril Islands, the Bonin Islands, and Mount Oshia, the Lokosha Islands, Formosa, and Pesagodes, and only insular territories or possessions in the Pacific Ocean, which Japan may hereafter acquire. 
The maintenance of the status quo under foreign government provisions implies that no new fortifications or naval bases shall be established in the territories and possessions specified, that no measures shall be taken to increase the existing naval facilities for the repair and maintenance of naval forces, and that no increase shall be made in the, co uh, in the coast defences of the territories and possessions above specified. This restriction, however, does not preclude such repair and replacement of worn-out weapons and equipment as is customary in naval military establishments in time of peace. All done to try and make Japan feel more secure. To make Japan feel safer. Because it's realized if they don't feel safe, they'll go on a building spree. And if they go on a building spree, it's going to get expensive quickly. So rather than do that, the Royal Navy and Royal Navy and the US Navy and like, Britain and America have said we won't fortify places. Again, this is another reason why Singapore becomes important, because you can fortify Singapore. Yet they don't. Perhaps if they've written into the treaty, but the British are specifically allowed to fortify Singapore, that would have meant the politicians have gone, oh, so we have to fortify Singapore, otherwise we look weak. <sighs> Dang bastard. Could also written, we will have uh, fortify, uh, fortify Hawaii and fortify other places. And good also, anyway, what's the big problem around Hong Kong? Where is the big problem around Hong Kong? Well, it's Bias Bay. Bias Bay. 65 miles north of Kong Ki, uh, Hong Kong, was notorious as the pirate stronghold in the United War years. Unfortunately, it was just outside Hong Kong territorial waters and came within the jurisdiction of the Cantonese authorities, who were either unwilling or unable to cooperate the Royal Navy against the pirates. The nationalist and anti-foreign feelings of the Cantonese probably contributed to this, as did the fact that the warlords of Kwantung were suspected of being in league with the pirates. Whether this was so or not, it was definitely established that pirates based on Bayos Bay committed nine major piracies between 1924 and 1926. In fact, the biggest ones the rule were committed by pirates from this place. It's a really problematic place for them to deal with. So, we've had the first two. Who are the next two admirals? Well, Vice Admiral Alan e Frederick Everett sounds like he's going to be a good guy. He's the Naval Secretary to First Fleet Lord. Was a good choice. Commodore Alan F. Everett, a genial, level-headed, hard-working officer of independent mind and considerable professional attainments. However, he doesn't stay in post long. In fact, he's there for about a year before he has basically a breakdown, as we understand it. The complexities of the station, perhaps legacy of World War One, all sort of things. Whatever happened, I couldn't find a picture of him, but I did find a picture of his replacement, his understudy, Rear Admiral David Murray Anderson, who was out there because the Yangtze River Station has a Rear Admiral in charge of it. Believe it or not, there are a fair number of senior officers deployed out to the Far East. The Royal Navy likes to have a lot of smart people out there if they can of various ranks. And Murray, David Murray Anderson goes on to a very interesting career in lots of different ways. So um, he's one person to look up. And then in 1924-6, Vice Admiral Sir Edwin Sinclair Alexander. Sinclair. And this is what the Earl of Cork and Orrery writes. Um, now... Cork and Orrery, as we all know from Norway, is not one of my favourite admirals. In fact, I consider him a bit of a mm, when it comes to it. I also, uh, I'm sure he did have a good career peak at some point, but it certainly wasn't uh, in the 1930s, and I from the, uh, don't think in the 1920s, and I'm fairly sure not in the 1940s. So probably World War One, he does very well. But I haven't dared look him up because otherwise I might be uh, uh, screaming at something. I was at this one time supposed to have great resemblance to Admiral Alexander Sinclair, and presumably that was so, for many people have treat greeted me in the belief that I was he. I have often noticed a look of disappointment appear on people's face when they discover their mistake. I can hardly flatter myself that he was suffered in the same way. I sincerely doubt it. So Sinclair is rated, Alexander Sinclair is rated as a very, very bright Admiral. A very, very smart cookie. And set out there for that reason. To keep an eye on Japan. It's, it's one of the easy ways the Royal Navy can work. Because think about this. 
The bulk of the Japanese Navy is going to be where? Sailing around Japan. And I often have this conversation when we're talking about modern British deployments and American deployments. Why do you send your smart officers out there and smart NCOs and smartest and best ships? Now, these days with social media and satellites and all the other intelligence, I guess it's, they might well have a more accurate picture of your wider fleet's deployments. But in the 1920s and 30s, and before that, if the officers and ships you saw day to day, or more frequently, were well run, well rounded, are very good at their jobs, very smart, look smart, look good, your impression of the fleet was it was more of the same. So if you want to maximize your presence and maximize your impact, you show, you send out your best because it makes you look even more powerful and impressive. You just need to have sufficient mass to be able to generate your best. Key events from 1924 to 6. Well, we have HMS Hermes wandering around. Um, Rear Admiral Anderson reports during July, and he remember he takes over post in April. 31st of July, 1925. Um, 31st of July, the Royal Marine Platoon from the light cruiser Durban was landed to protect life and property at the premises of the International Export Company, Nanking, where there was some labor trouble. In the course of rem removing the mob, a detachment of Chinese police injured some copy uh, co coolies. With a xenophobic bias rather typical at the time, quite untruthfully, it was reported in, a, in an element of local press that Royal Marines had killed the men. Now, as I said, I have not read the file in the archives for a while about that incident. But as I remember it, the gentlemen were killed by discharging of guns. And the reason he didn't think anyone the Marines had done it is because they still had all their ammunition when they got back. But, mm. August, HMS Hermes arrives in the Far East under the command of Captain Cecil Talbot. Cool. December, Mr. Cecil Clementi, important gentleman, governor of Hong Kong, wrote, The forces of Red Kanto government are mainly under control of General Xing Chiang. Kang Sh Kai Shek, who is said to be a professional soldier and not a politician. I can get no reliable information concerning him, and I do not know how far he is under Bolshevik incidents. His troops certainly have been drilled and equipped by the Russians. There is a lot of Russian involvement going on in China, and this is one of the things that worries British, worries Japan, worries America, and turns out worries Chiang Kai Shek. 1926, January, Mr. Cecil, Cecil Clementi. Governor of Hong Kong wrote, Number of Russian Bolsheviks presently in Canton is 144 men. No trace of active women agents. I'm not sure Mr. Clementi would know. Clementi is a very good diplomat. I'm not sure he would know if there was active women agents or not out there. Um, unless he's particularly, you know, interested in certain accents appearing next to him at a, a, a cocktail parties. Each Chinese regiment has two Russian military instructors. The head of the Soviets in South China is named Borodin. This is very accurate. On March 1926, on 20th, uh, 20th at 0300 hours, Chiang Kai-shek acted to reverse the growing Soviet influence. I was worried that he might be soon being got rid of. 25 communists were arrested. The Soviet advisors were all confined to their residence. This all served to make Xiang Li uh, Shang leader of the Kuomintang. Furthermore, he managed to do this without upsetting a Borodin, and so could then proceed to march on the north of China without risking Russian intervention. And all this is going on in the world. Britain's trying to keep an idea, trying to watch it, but in May 1926, the general strike's happening. They have things at home. This is one of the problems, and also one of the reasons why I often point out you have a foreign secretary and a home secretary in the cabinet. <laughs> And it's a bit sort of cruel because the Home Secretary arguably has to deal with the more complex scenario in terms of running all, dealing with all the complexities of what's happening on in the home. But the Foreign Secretary has to deal with not just your relationships with other people around the world, but their relationships with each other. 
And you can say you don't have the defense secretary, but honestly, the defense secretary's job is to try and run the defense industrial base to make sure you are generating enough personnel and enough good, good quality science and maintaining enough capabilities that you can do something if you need to do something with your military power. So, part two will be 1926-1931. And, well, I hope you join me for that. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Take care.